the best laid plans. Baba Linda on the Queensland coast is 11 miles from Gordon, which is the next station north of it on the North Coast Railway. There is no settlement near the railway in between, the country being useless, low and marshy from the ocean nearly to the foothills of the range, watered by brackish swamps and salt arms, and for the most part overgrown with swamp palms and mangroves. Its inhabitants, the wild ducks and magpie geese, and the crocodiles and devil crabs that perhaps will hold it always, or rather it should be said that these are the regular inhabitants, since the human creatures with whom this story mainly deals are first seen camped there. They were four men who were camped with a motor truck in a spot about four miles from Gordon, and some little distance from the road that follows the railway, screened from those avenues by a thicket of pandanus. It was eight o'clock in the morning of a day that was of no more importance, generally, than that it was the one preceding government payday and one of the days in the week on which the mail train from Brisbane passes through the locality on its way from Port Magnetic to the sugar town of Nairn. But to these four men it was the day of all days. The train was due to pass the vicinity of their camp soon after noon. The permanent way men who were running the length before it had just passed on their motor trolley going north to Nairn, from whence they would return later in the afternoon. The four had been waiting for their passing since the dawn. It was the signal for their breaking camp. Swiftly and silently they set to work, not that they had any need to be silent, nor much to be swift, but were absorbed in considering the business of this day of days, and eager to be at it, anxious to have done with it indeed. Even though believing that their well-planned project could not fail, although they took care to leave behind them nothing that might lead to the discovery of their identity, and had been at pains to keep the existence of their camp a secret since establishing it several days before, they made no attempt to obliterate the traces of their residence, and when leaving, instead of taking the motor truck back to the road by the same roundabout and since obscured route by which they had brought it to the camp, took it straight forward, knocking the scrub down and leaving deep wheel tracks in the greasy earth. All rode on the truck, fearless of meeting anyone on the road, for all their desire not to be seen in the locality, because by careful inquiry and observation they had become acquainted with all who habitually used that road. Rarely any but habitual travelers used it, and they were few and never to be seen on it on train days, and never so early in the day. Another road ran through the populous Sugar King country at the foot of the range. That was the main road and the favorite route between the towns of Babalinda and Gordon. The fact that it was somewhat longer than that which followed the railway being much outweighed by the fact that it was infinitely better kept and much more cheerful. As that was the height 
of the cane cutting season, and Bobalinda and Gordon, and the settlements along the range, were thronged. The four men had been able to make their inquiries and observations easily, and with all the secrecy they wished. They had been working in the sugar cane themselves. One had been an engine driver of a narrow gauge mill train employed by the great Bobalinda Mill. He was an engine driver by profession, but not generally by occupation. He was the leader, a squat, stout, slow moving fellow with a broad, expressionless face. If anything, he looked rather stupid. Certainly, he did not look the clever rogue he was, nor did his crew look the part. Their inclinations made them play. One was a merry, florid, red headed fellow, rotound and middle aged, like his chief. The others were ordinary, roguish looking young men in the late twenties. All were shrewd and hardened criminals. They reached the road, turned into it, and proceeded northward for about twenty yards to stop when they came to a bush track that led to the west. This track led to the range road, passing no habitation on the way, and was rarely, if ever, used. The four men had found it overgrown. The red headed man was at the wheel. The others dropped to the ground. The leader spoke. The red head put the truck into reverse, swung it to the right, and directed by the others, backed it off the road and up to the high embankment of the railway, there being no fence to impede him. The truck came to rest with its rear dug deep in the embankment. The leader and the young men then took a long broad plank from the truck, carried it up the embankment, and set it down so that one end rested on the cess path beside a rail and the other in the back of the truck, just as though they were going to use it to slide some heavy object down, as indeed it was their intention to cause anyone who came after them to think they had done. After a few minutes of this stimulating, they hurled the plank back into the truck, climbed aboard, and set off up the overgrown track towards the range. Half an hour later, the truck turned into the range road, its crew having first made sure that no one was about to see the turning, yet taking pains to leave marked traces of it. Thenceforth, they need not trouble about their tracks, because the main road was bitumen. The tracks they left in turning led towards Gordon, but the truck went no more than a hundred yards in that direction, then turned about carefully, and when the crew were satisfied that no trace of that second turning had been left, sped towards Bobalinda. They did not encounter traffic till they had gone several miles down the range road. Meanwhile they raced, except when passing settlements, when they slackened pace so as not to attract undue attention. They arrived in Bobalinda shortly after ten. The leader and one of the young men alighted in the center of the busy little town, and the others went a short distance to deliver up the truck to the man they had hired it from. Bobalinda is a refreshment stop, which means that the locomotives of passing trains are greased and watered there. Usually the train stops for twenty minutes. That day it stopped for several hours, consequent on the acts of these four men. The four were waiting at the station when the train arrived, lounging with the crowd before the station buildings. The train drew in and stopped. Passengers alighted on the track. 
there being no platform. In a moment, the vicinity was thronged. The four paid no attention to the throng. First they stared at the locomotive, and then at the brake van. Then followed with their eyes the station master, who, with a policeman sauntering in his wake, was going with a bag, as they knew he was, to collect the fortnight's wages for the district staff from the traveling railway pay clerk, not that they were interested in the money he would get. Their interest was in the source of it, the 11,000 odd pounds in silver and notes of small denomination that reposed in the safe of the pay clerk's little office in the van, packed ready for distribution. From the van, they turned again to the locomotive. The driver was down, oil can in hand, attending to the rods. The fireman was standing on the coal, in the act of pulling in the water hydrant. A moment of watching, then the leader spat, and sauntered away towards the engine, and the two young men strolled after him, each with a rolled-up sugar bag under his arm. Redhead stayed lounging. At his feet lay a well-filled sack. The sauntering trio had covered about half the distance to the engine when the driver, who had been working towards the front of his machine, stood erect, wiped his oil can with a piece of waste, puffed hard on his pipe, then stepped round the cow catcher and out of sight. He was going to oil up on the other side. At that, the three men quickened their pace. They passed by the tender in single file, so close that the firemen could not see them. The leader went on after the driver. The others slipped up into the cab and crawled on hands and knees across the footplate to the right-hand side. One climbed into the driving seat and squatted there on his haunches, high up and out of line of vision of the firemen, while commanding a view of things ahead through the driving window. The other crouched in the corner by the tender, close to the exit on that same side. Both masked their faces to the eyes with handkerchiefs, then the one by the exit unrolled his bag and took out a length of stout lead piping. The leader standing before the locomotive on the track was watching the engine driver at his work, unseen by anyone but the man at the bull's-eye window, at whom he glanced from time to time nor did he fear to be seen by any other eyes, knowing that the station staff were at their dinner. A minute or two of watching and waiting, amid the roar of gushing water and the bubble and hiss of steam. Then the leader nodded. The man at the window raised a hand. The man by the exit raised his leaden pipe. The engine driver had finished oiling. He went to the steps of the cab and began to climb. As his head appeared, the man with the pipe struck it a terrific blow. The driver sagged. The leader was behind to prop him up. The man with pipe pulled him into the cab, and the other trussed him hand and foot and tied his head up in a sugar bag. Three minutes later, the fireman dropped down from the coal whistling. In a matter of seconds, he was lying senseless with his mate. Then the young man who had struck the blows dropped out of the cab on the right side 
and went to the rear and uncoupled the engine from the train. This done, he set off quickly down the train, keeping to the right-hand side till he was opposite the station buildings, when he climbed onto and across the platform of a car and dropped down among the crowd on the other side. He strolled up to Red Head, who grinned. Red Head already knew that the first move had met with success. Having seen the locomotive move as planned, he turned again to it. Now it was slowing down beyond a set of points, which the other young man was in the act of switching. Now the locomotive was stopped, now running back, now swinging to the track that passed the train on the right-hand side. Redhead and his companion turned their attention to the sack at their feet. This contained several stout iron bars and tackle blocks and rope, and was labeled passenger's luggage. Between them, they lifted it and carried it to the van, which they reached as the engine rumbled by. The big side doors of the van were open. Porters on the ground were tossing in parcels, which were being stowed away by another porter, and presently by the guard as well, who at the moment of the arrival of Red Head and his mate had gone out to the platform of the caboose at the rear to see what the engine was doing. The pair tossed the sack in, then lounged about watching, waiting for the completion of the loading and the dispersal of those engaged in it before they made their move. The pay clerk, standing at the door of his compartment, which occupied the blind front end of the van, was also watching. Between his legs, the pair could see the top of the built-in safe, above an intervening crate of quacking ducks, could even see the combination lock of it. Some minutes of waiting. Soon, the engine was back on the main line, standing far off, waiting for the signal to approach. Red Head gave the signal when the porter who was working with the guard dropped out of the van and followed his retreating colleagues. And as he gave it, the guard slammed the big side doors. Then Red Head strolled off to disconnect the van from the rest of the train and his mate went off in the opposite direction and climbed up the steps of the caboose. The engine started. Redhead's mate found the guard in the caboose, bending over a book with his back turned. He whipped out his leaden pipe and knocked him senseless with a blow. He found the pay clerk in the body of the van idly studying the crate of ducks. Dealing with him was not so easy. He turned, saw the masked face, and started. The young man rushed him, dealt him a terrific blow, but failed to fail him. The pay clerk yelled, dodged a second blow, and made a rush for his office. The young man leapt at him again, caught him on the side of the head, and knocked him senseless. He and Red Head were trussing both victims when the engine arrived. Clank of couplings. Then the van and the engine were moving back. Soon they were on the right-hand track again, and moving swiftly past the train while the station master and his staff were running out to see what liberties were being taken with their siding. At the head of the siding was a signal and a gate. The signal disappeared in smoke. The gate flew up in splinters. The people at the station gaped at a point about half a mile from 
Babalinda after less than a minute's run. The leader stopped the engine with a jerk. He was alone, his mate having left him to join the others in the van to help hack out the pay clerk safe with tools they found in the breakdown kit alone. That is, except for the engine driver and the fireman, who were now writhing and bellowing in their bags. The leader took each one and dropped him from the cab, and while he was doing so, Redhead and one of the young men were disposing of the guard and pay clerk similarly, and the other young man was throwing a hooked wire hawser taken from the breakdown kit over the telegraph line. The others helped the young man with the hawser. In a moment, it was made fast. Then the leader, who was watching, started the train off with a jerk, and down came the telegraph line with a mighty twang and a hiss of flying wires. Nothing to fear from Gordon now, and since the Babalinda motor quad was out on service, pursuit from there would be delayed till pursuers commandeered a car, and would be further delayed <clears throat> by the state of the road the car must travel. Five minutes later, the train slowed down from terrific speed, near the 169-mile bridge, <clears throat> which spans a deep, wide salt arm, navigable from the sea, situated about four miles from Gordon, and within a hundred yards of the spot where the four had scored the embankment that morning. The train stopped on the bridge, so that the van stood directly above a motor launch, a vessel of moderate size that bore fisheries license numbers. That was moored to a pile on the left-hand side, facing the rickety road bridge. The men in the van had the safe free now. While they were dragging it to the doorway, the leader, who had come from the engine, was rigging the derrick and block and tackle. In a moment, the safe was lashed, <clears throat> swung carefully out, and lowered to the launch. Then Redhead pointed to a stack of cases of whiskey. The leader nodded and pointed to a pile of hams and to the crate of squalling ducks. Then he leant out and signaled to the launchman. Up came the sling again, and down it went again, with three cases of whiskey, and two hams, and the crate of ducks. Then the tackle was freed and dropped into the launch, and the derrick dropped into the muddy water. The leader went back to the engine. A moment later, the train was on the move again. It stopped exactly where the plank had been placed that morning. Then all four descended, stepped into the middle of the track, and sprinted back to the bridge. As they neared the bridge, a wild burst of quacking greeted them. They grinned as they ran. Then, with the quacking, was merged the wild shrieking of a human voice. The four stopped grinning and raced. They reached the bridge in time to see a monster crocodile clinging to the side of the careening launch, seize with its jaws the crate of ducks. The launch turned over. The launchman struggled to the shore and leapt up it yelling. He flew to the railway. The five stood, goggling at each other for a moment. Then as one man, they turned to the south and listened. On a gust of wind came the roar of a racing car. Femme Fatale The aerial ambulance dropped out of the midday sky, down to the crimson swath, 
in the wide gray wilderness of bleached grass and stunted trees down to the airstrip of the cattle station she touched down to go racing ahead of a vermilion dust storm up to where the little fuel shed stood like a lighthouse in the shimmering sea of mirage another smaller dust storm was converging on the shed from the east as the ambulance halted a utility truck drew up beside the shed the aircraft's engines opened lusty throats in one last roar sending piled horse dung and dead grass whirling away in a willy-willy then silence the silence of the wide gulf country silence that comes pressing from empty horizons silence that can beat upon the brain in the aircraft besides the pilot were the sergeant of police from normanton the new doctor and an ambulance bearer they alighted with that awkwardness of those just returned to the heaviness of earth from the lightsome freedom of the skies there were two people in the truck one was a slight man of middle age mean featured wearing a blue shirt and a wide hat pulled down so that he must cock his head elevating his sharp jaw to peer beneath it the other was a young girl drooping sniveling into a handkerchief giving only a glimpse of the broad features and curious pasty swarthiness of the quarter caste aboriginal the man got out of the truck quizzing the group of men with unseen eyes his out thrust jaw working nervously he addressed the men his voice thin nasal good day ah uh, are ya the men nodded he went on sorry to drag yous out all this way you got the strength what's appenin i suppose they was a lot of static on the radio when i was talkin the ambulance center last night i don't know if the operator bloke got it right what i was tellin em the sergeant said it was reported there'd been a shooting here that's right that yeller feller bateman shot my son-in-law shot dead that's right i was afraid something like this had happened they's been bad blood between em a long while the sergeant asked where's the half caste now bateman he's back at the homestead you got him under restraint ah no he ain't violent he never tried to get away fact he reckon he never done it he reckon gooch must a shot itself but gooch didn't i can tell you that they had a fight over my daughter here they been fightin a lot lately gooch chucked bateman out a his quarters when he came there to stop him beltin my girl bateman come back with his rifle that's ow it was sergeant the sergeant's hard blue stare never left the bit of the small face that could be seen beneath the hat he asked you see the actual shooting mr turley the out thrust jaw worked swiftly well not the actual shootin sergeant but i seen bateman at gooch's door just a moment after the shot went off what time was it quarter past nine last night i was listenin the nine o'clock shortwave news when they was rowin and i turned up the volume to drown em out that's after i heard em my little girl come home where'd it happen in gooch's quarters philly here 
always come back home when there was a row on. I heard her go to her room crying. Then I hear a shot, and I run out, and I see Bateman standing looking in the door of Gooch's quarters. They was a light. I run straight across and ask Bateman what he done. He reckoned he never done nothing, but there was Gooch on the floor, all covered in blood. Where was the rifle? That was on the floor, too, but it, <clears throat> it weren't close enough for it to have been dropped by Gooch. I reckon it'd have fallen on top of him. Sides, the mongrel Gooch wouldn't have killed himself. He was too pleased with his rotten self. I reckon Bateman chucked the rifle in after firing it. For a moment, the sergeant searched for the hidden eyes. Then he murmured, Hmm, well, let's go and have a look at things. The ambulance man loaded a stretcher into the back of the utility and climbed in after it. The sergeant also got in the back, leaving the front seat to the doctor. The pilot stayed behind. They set off along a road, cutting almost axle-deep into the baked red earth, through a waste of silver-leafed scrub and crimson ant hills, for about a mile, when out of the flowing silver of mirage loomed the roofs and the tanks and the tops of the few shade trees of the homestead. It was a poor place, three or four whitewashed iron shacks, and some sheds and stockyards on a grassless, cattle-dung-strewn flat, beside a lagoon of milky water that was all remaining hereabout of a river that ran a mile wide for a few days of the year. Out of the few gnarled coolabas that fringed the water hole, a flock of galas flew up and swept away like a storm of blown pink blossoms, plaintively protesting at the intrusion of strangers. Under mango trees were horses that stared as with hostility at the utility truck, <clears throat> and on the veranda of one of the shacks, a group of native stockmen in brilliant shirts and sombreros who peeped from amongst hanging saddles and at the door of the detached kitchen behind the biggest of the houses, a couple of black gins who slipped back out of sight as the truck approached. The truck halted under a mango shading one of the shacks. The silence fell again as the people alighted from the utility. One of the stockmen detached himself from the group and came sauntering, walking awkwardly in riding boots. He wore a magenta shirt and black sombrero and white moleskins. He was a half-caste, copper-skinned, broad-featured, a young man, and one who fancied himself by his get-up and his side levers and his razor-trimmed mustache. The sergeant said to Turley, This Bateman, that's the mongrel liar. The sergeant waited for Bateman, who came up with face, working in the way of the aboriginal. Under deep emotional stress, with bright breast heaving, the sergeant said, Good day, Bateman. The half-caste gasped. Good day, Sergeant. I didn't done it, Sergeant Dinkum. His thick under lip was broken and still oozing blood, and one of his deep set eyes was discolored. The Sergeant said, You been fighting? Yas. Who with? That dead feller. But I no more been kill him, boss Dinkum. He blinked and quivered under the blue policeman gaze. The sergeant snapped. 
I'll talk to you later. Wait here. He turned to Turley. Where's the body? Turley motioned to the shack they stood before, put his hand in a pocket to extract a key, saying, I locked it up so nobody could touch nothing. Turley turned to his daughter, still sitting in the truck. You get along into the house, Philly, the sergeant said. She better get a few things ready. I want you to come back in the plane with me. For a moment, Turley's sharp jaw worked. Then he murmured, Okay, and led the way into the shack across the ant bed veranda. The door led directly into a sitting room, furnished <clears throat> in cane, with magazine pictures stuck to the corrugated iron walls, paper flowers in glass jars. On the floor beside the cane table, with one waxy hand outflung, the dead man lay sprawled upon his back, clad only in pajama shorts and singlet, a big fellow, on the lean side, hook-nosed, blue-eyed, with a shock of straight fair hair, now stuck in a congealed pool of blood about the head. The breast was a mass of dried blood, and likewise the lower part of his face. Flies swept up with a whir at the party's entry. A heavy repeating rifle lay crosswise close to the waxy feet. The sergeant's eyes seemed to be photographing the scene. At length he turned to Turley, quizzing, searching for the still hidden eyes. Is that how you left things here? Turley's jaw was working overtime. He had difficulty in answering. That's it. That's how I found him, too. Did you touch the rifle after the shooting? Turley answered quickly. No fear. I didn't want me fingerprints on it. When the yeller feller started denying, he shot him. The sergeant bent over the corpse, shot above the heart, by the look of it, a doctor. The doctor began his examination. The sergeant rose, took out his handkerchief, and with it picked up the rifle and examined it. Then, still holding the rifle, he looked carefully around the room. After a few minutes, he said, Leave it to you, doctor. Then he went out. Turley turned from the door to follow him. The ambulance man, lifting the corpse onto the stretcher, muttered, this is the second stiff I've collected here, shot on account of that creamy piece filly. Femme fatale, murmured the doctor. Was that, Doc? The fatal woman. What exactly was the other affair? Mick Turley done the other bloke himself. That other bloke was another half-caste. The old feller's always been dead jealous about his pretty, creamy daughter. He went up for manslaughter for that, but got out of it. He pleaded he had to take the gun to the yeller feller to stop him taking his daughter away. His daughter was underage, and he had to protect her, and the yeller feller was known to be cheeky. Turley reckoned the bloke tried to take the rifle off of him, and that it went off in the struggle. Hmm, we'll have to tie that hand in. The dead hand, with arm now bent back, seemed to be claiming attention. The ambulance bearer addressed the corpse. Come on, Stiff, get that hand in. We want to tuck you up for your ride to town. To the doctor, he went on. It's a wonder Turley didn't shoot this one, too. This bloke beat him for Philly by whisking her away on the mail plane. One time she was in Normanton with her old man. He took her to Cairns and married her. 
Old Mick hated goosh-like poison, but he had to have him back to live here or love his little girl. That yeller feller Bateman's done Old Mick a real good turn. The bearer added, You'll get plenty of shootings while you're round these parts, Doc. They're always getting the gun out. It's the awful quiet out here that does it, I reckon. Start some brooding, get some down. Out at the truck, the sergeant with Turley at his elbow was questioning Bateman. If you wasn't mixed up with the girl, Bateman, what did you want to go interfering in the rose she had with her husband for? Ah, I don't like him knocking her about. <coughs> her father was here to look after her. Boss here been ask him me stop him. Turley cut in. I only asked you once. One time he took to me. You ask him me too three time, boss. You say, s'pose you kill him that cow. I give him you filly. You low down lion dog you. I never said nothing the sort. Course you did. What me give my little girl to a mongrel boong like you? The sergeant snapped. That'll do both of you. He turned to Bateman. We'll go on with what happened last night. Blinking, quivering, gasping his words. Bateman went on. Like, like I've been telling you, sergeant, they's having a row again. I don't like it. I've been go across and pull him off of her. She runned away to her old man. Then that bloke, he gets to me. Yes, well, he too good for me, that bloke. He give him me beltin' and chuck me out. I been go back my room. I'm out the back veranda washing face. When I hear him shot, I come out pretty quick. I think maybe he gone after Philly. They's still a light there in the house. But I don't see nobody. I runned back to look. I see them there lying on the floor, blood coming out of his chest and mouth. I see the rifle there. I reckon he must have shot himself. I am standing there when boss here come. He reckon I shot him. I say I didn't. I didn't too, Sergeant. Dinkum, I didn't. Did you handle the rifle at all? No, Sergeant. I never touch rifle. I never touch nothing. Turley snarled. You was handling that rifle yesterday evening. You used it for the kill. Bateman turned on him, blinking. The sergeant asked. That right, Bateman. That's right, sergeant. I been killin' Bullock for beef. I been drop him with rifle, but I didn't. What did you do with the rifle afterwards? I been put him back kitchen. That rifle stopped kitchen always. When did you put it back? After butchering. Time I come for supper. Anybody see you put it back? I dunno. Them lubras is there grilling steak. Pretty busy. The sergeant asked Turley, Is the kitchen kept locked? Not usually. It wasn't locked last night. Anybody could take the rifle out any time. That's right, and I reckon you'll find bif the fingerprints that this bloke here got it out after Gooch belted him and went and shot him and chucked the rifle in so's to make it look like Gooch shot himself. Bateman, his face jerking wildly, moaned, I didn't, I tell ya, I didn't. Well, soon find out if you did or you didn't, said the sergeant. If the post-mortem shows it wasn't suicide, the CIB Cairns will investigate and nothing gets past them. So if you're hiding anything, any of you, you best speak up and save a lot of time and trouble. Turley and Bateman were silent, looking now at the ambulance man 
and doctor bringing the dead man out on the stretcher. <clears throat> that recalcitrant hand bulged, quivering, under the shrouding blanket. The sergeant grunted, Okay, I want to look round a bit and question the rest of the people here. You'll have to come back in the plane, Bateman. I'll want a sworn statement from you. Better get anything you want to take. Turley said, I'll get em. Get us a bit of dinner, Sergeant. Okay, we'll go right after. It was an awkward meal that was partaken of in the kitchen an hour or so later. The whites, including Philly, sat at table. Bateman had his in Boong style out in the wood box on the veranda. Turley still wore his hat. Philly was the only one frank in acknowledgement of what intruded on the company like a shadow, like the bulge of that stiff hand beneath the blanket on the stretcher now in the back of the utility under the mango tree. She sniffled the grief of her widowhood or of whatever it truly was into the funeral corned beef and pumpkin. The men at the table talked gravely of cattle, of the neighboring stations, their precious water, their scanty grass. Bateman sat chewing absently, his primitive man's face blank, his deep-set eyes fixed on the truck, perhaps on the hand beneath the blanket, still seeming to be trying to attract attention. Straight after the meal, the party set out. Now Bateman rode in the back with the ambulance man and the sergeant and the dead man, who, bumping about on the floor to the rough going, shoved as if angrily at the other's feet. So, back to the airstrip and the aircraft. There was just enough seating for the complement, three seats in line on the port side, two on the starboard. The entrance was on the port side, hence there was more room on the starboard. Actually room for four seats, but the space of two was occupied by a frame for the stretcher, placed between the two seats. The sergeant sat in the seat behind the stretcher, the ambulance man in, the, in that ahead. Across the aisle sat Bateman at the rear, then Turley with Philly up in front. The doctor shared the cockpit with the pilot. The aircraft's engines came to life, coughing, spluttering, found voice and roared. She swung from the, <clears throat> from the shed and trailing the red veil, danced her lightsome way down to the end of the strip, there to stand straining on brakes, raging at full bore in preparation for flight. Inside the insulated cabin, it was comparatively quiet. Then the plane leapt away and take off, sped roaring up the red swath, rose to wing the sky, but with the going no less rough than on the blazing earth, from which the turbulence rolled up boiling, the belted passengers lurched in their seats, the strapped and shrouded dead man in the stretcher. It was turbulent to 6,000 feet, at which the plane leveled out to go boring through the blue enamel, void at its hundred knots and more, yet seeming to hang there, in a world timeless and weightless, to drift on the aeolian music of its engines. The passengers sat as if entranced. Then into the song of the engines a discord intruded, indefinable to begin with, a mere mumbling, but the source of it indubitable as when suddenly it rose to a rasping moan. The turning of all heads showed toward the stretcher. The blanket above the breast was swelling, swelling, the bulge of the stiff hand quivering, the watching eyes popped, turleys to be seen for the first time, looking like marbles shot with red and blue, the blanket 
swelled, swelled, then collapsed to a hoarse cry from the form beneath. Bateman craning, gaping, gasped. He ain't dead at all. Turley's face had turned greenish. His lean jaw hung slack, tearing off his seat belt. Bateman rose, flung himself across the aisle to snatch at the straps of the stretcher. The ambulance man jerked back his head to see, flung back a restraining arm, exclaiming, Hey, what are you doing? <clears throat> what are you doing? Bateman yelled, He ain't dead. Get him out. He's dead all right, mate. Sit down. You'll be upsetting the trim of the aircraft. He been sing out. I been hear him. Get him out. He tell you I didn't done it. He wasn't singing out. That's only the gas coming out of him. Account of the altitude. The sergeant rose, laid large hands on Bateman, shoved him back to his seat, while Bateman babbled, I been hear him, I been see him. Sit down, boy, and keep quiet. The sergeant leant over Mick Turley, staring into the drawn, sick face, into the horrified eyes, saying sharply, You done it, eh, Turley? Turley's tongue flickered over his thin lips. The sergeant seized his shoulder, shook him. You shot Gooch, didn't you? Turley blinked and nodded. Why'd you try to put the blame on Bateman? Turley gasped. Another mongrel dog, hanging round my little girl. How'd you do it? Got the rifle out of the kitchen, wrapped a handkerchief round it, shot the dog from just outside the door, and chucked the rifle in. I wanted to get both the mongrels. I've been waiting for the chance a long time. Turley sighed shudderingly, cast a glance at his daughter staring back at him out of wide black eyes, then turned again to the sergeant. Look after her for me when you lock me up. Will you, sergeant, keep all them dogs away?